All righty, welcome. We are recording, and this is now week seven, I believe, of our collage uh, seminar course on coronal heating and the solar wind. I've got the chat up so I can take note of anybody uh, chiming in about anything. Um, yeah, and we're going to be continuing to talk about the solar wind now after we've done a lot with coronal heating. Um, we'll, we'll go into depth a little bit about some of the other acceleration mechanisms that sort of go beyond Parker's uh, you know, classic 1958 isothermal model. Um, and we'll also take a look at the, uh, the, the second Python notebook, the hands-on exercises on the solar wind. I wish I would have had time to, to add some of these bells and whistles into, into the notebook, but I guess that gives, gives a good opportunity for you to do that in your, in your, uh, in your exercise. But yeah, so what I'll just do is, is just uh, have a few slides about a few of the, uh, a few of the physical ingredients that are that are going to show up in the notebook, just to get you familiar with them, because they do go a bit beyond the Parker 1958 theory that we talked about last time. And then we'll we'll I'll I'll, I'll come back and we'll talk about some of these other ways of accelerating the solar wind. Still, just talking about one-dimensional models where the the plasma is following the magnetic field on its way out from the sun. Next week, we'll talk about multi-dimensional effects that happen way out in the solar wind, like uh, co-rotating interaction regions. But yeah, this is just sort of the acceleration region, uh, sort of in the first few to dozens of solar radii near the sun. But there's a lot of interesting physics that sort of generates why there are fast and slow solar streams. And hopefully we'll, I'll reference some of, the, some of the readings that you looked at before now. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to just say a few more words about what the what the equations look like because in the in the notebook there's a few generalizations that go beyond the Parker isothermal model. Just to remind you of the Parker isothermal model, once you deal with the pressure derivative, the pressure gradient force, it ends up creating some terms on the left hand side, some terms on the right hand side, and we looked at the overall solution topology last time, right? There were these terms where it's, whoops, where it's, you know, plus, plus, minus, minus, plus, minus, minus, plus, and that gives you these four different regions. Um, and yeah, the, on the right-hand side, th there's the nice physical interpretation that the pressure gradient force uh, produces a positive outward acceleration. Gravity has this neg negative inward acceleration, and the place where they cross is the Parker critical point. Uh, the one the one complication that is that we need to, to to keep in mind is that when we have a temperature that's varying as a function of radius, you know, going beyond just this isothermal constant temperature model, there's an extra term on that right hand side. It turns out to be a negative term, but it depends on the slope of the temperature with with radius. Um, it's usually not an important term because when you group it together with the original. Pressure, pressure gradient term, that's usually going to end up being always positive to, to produce the same type of, you know, four quadrants like we had before. Um, but yeah, that's got to be, that's got to be taken into account. If you remember the C sub I was the, uh, the so-called isothermal sound speed that's just proportional, that where, C, where the square of the sound speed is proportional to temperature. Um, and operationally, it complicates things a little bit because when this is no longer a constant, if you wanna figure out the critical velocity, you know, the place where this left-hand side term goes to zero, first you have to figure out where the critical radius is, then evaluate this at that radius, and then that tells you the critical velocity. So it's not just a known constant like it was last time. Yeah, okay, there was that. Then there, then of course that, that brings up the question, what do we use if we're producing models? What do we use for this temperature as a function of radius? Um, the thing I showed uh, in one of the plots last time that I'll show in just a second came from a came from a uh, a model that I think was kind of interesting, where it essentially took this uh, coronal heating model that that we looked at back in week two, right? Remember where I balanced just heat, you know, the the addition of heat with the heat conduction, and we got this. Uh, it, it started off as a as a y of x, you know, quadratic function. But then if you convert it back to physical units, temperature as a function of position, it sort of looks like this. Um, 
turns out you can do that for the open field lines of the solar wind, right? This was done for a coronal loop where we had to impose boundary conditions of symmetry at the peak of the loop. But it turns out you can do it. Whoops, I clicked twice, but there's the, there's the thing I showed last time. And uh, uh, what, what Avery Schiff and I published last year was sort of a cousin of that law for the open field solar wind. So it's basically a, a nice analytic model of the temperature, but now as a function of radius, where the radius goes from the sun all the way out to infinity. And it turns out that a that a, a good parameter to include there in the in the loop model we assumed the heating rate was constant, but in the solar wind, a more general thing is to assume sort of a power law dependence with radius. This psi exponent is the is just a chosen exponent, and it turns out you can you can solve the differential equation in the same way we did there uh, for a nice function of radius that depends on the psi. Um, it turns out that there's also this x coordinate, which is which is the radial distance where the temperature maximum happens, and that's also just a function of this psi in this model. Um, yeah, so it's just a convenient thing that that gives you a sort of a family of models. You know, if you vary the t max, you get these. If you vary this delta exponent, uh, which actually isn't specified in the model. If, if we just followed the standard heat conduction law that we looked at before, we would have gotten two sevenths for that. But it turns out you can vary it as a free parameter also and look at different slopes of the radial gradient of the temperature out in interplanetary space. And you can figure out what slope works best with some of the data. You know, Here's, I think, Ulysses, Helios, and Parker Solar Probe data for electron temperature. If you can find the right value. Um, yeah, so this turns out to be a, a, a useful tool to, and you can play around with the parameters in the notebook, as we'll see in a second. But there's one more thought that needs to be talked about before we look at the notebook, and that that uh, is about using this right-hand side to find the location of the critical point. Remember last time we found that it's the place where the right-hand side crosses zero, but it turns out when we put in more complicated physics, it turns out that, that this right-hand side can actually cross zero multiple times. And that actually can happen for realistic models of the solar wind. So then how do we find the critical point? You might've read a little bit about this in the, in the two papers, uh, but I wanted to just summarize because what Kopp and Holzer realized in the 1970s is that, well, when the right-hand side equals zero, that is also the same, that, that those places where the right-hand side equals zero are also the same places where the integral of the right-hand side has a flat slope, right? That's either a minimum, a local minimum or a local maximum, right? Because if this is the integral of the right-hand side, the derivative is just the right-hand side itself. And those are the zeros, right? The, the places where the slope is flat. And Kopp and Holzer realized that the the true actual critical point that makes sense for a global model that goes all the way from the sun out to infinity is the place that corresponds to a global minimum in this integral of the right-hand side. And there's explanations in their paper about why that's the case, uh, why mathematically that's the case. And I, I've, I think I understood it once, but it's one of those things where you really have to think about it to, to understand it. But it's a, it's a relatively straightforward and easy criterion to implement. And I wanted to talk about that because, whoops. Yeah, the next step is to look through the notebook and because I, I wanted to implement as many of these things as possible so that you can more easily uh, generalize the physics. So yeah, and I'm, I'm also plotting Parker's hand-drawn hand plot here because that's one of the things that the notebook uh, that, uh, that we would like to reproduce with the notebook. So let me share that. Um, so yeah, I've put the uh, I've put this up on the Slack channel, and I'll also put it on the web page. So yeah, uh, the goal is to numerically integrate these critical point type equations with a, with with all the physics bells and whistles, and figure out what is the what is the acceleration of the solar wind look like. So I don't know. I can just go through some of the uh, some of the standard things. I'll bring up the chat again. Um, importing the packages. So uh, thanks to a few of the of the students who submitted these things. 
to, to point out the need for defining functions if you want to run these things again and again. So I've defined a function where you can put in some of the parameters and then get out some of the, uh, and you know, all the all the numerical integration is being done in this big function. Maybe it could have been modularized a little more, but it's I think it's useful for this, this purpose. So basically we have a function that will give us the uh, wind speed if we give it the, um, the, uh, the number of radial grid zones, which, I'm, which, uh, which we'll see in a second, usually has to be pretty big. Um, the largest height in units of solar radii, that's what I usually mean by Rx. Um, there's the mu, co the, the, the mu parameter for the uh, mean atomic mass you know, per particle which is usually about 0.5 for ionized hydrogen, maximum temperature, and then these other uh, temperature, uh, temperature model parameters, you know, setting up the constants, setting up the radial array, which is sort of logarithmic from the sun out to that maximum distance. RCM is the you know, CGS unit uh, radial coordinate in actual you know, centimeter units. Then I take a uh, this n this numpy gradient function is actually a finite differencing uh, uh, routine that, that gives you the gives you the differences between subsequent elements. So drcm is going to be sort of something we use to integrate with. Um, setting up the temperature function again, just using those equations that I showed on the slide. Um, but then once you get the temperature, we need to set up the right hand side of the of the Parker equation. Um, for variables, I think I'm using A instead of C for the sound speed. So A squared is the square of the sound speed. D, A squared dr is its radial derivative, the right-hand side. I'm also taking the radial derivative of the right-hand side, which I didn't talk about, and then also the radial, the uh, integral of the right-hand side. This cumulative sum function in NumPy is useful for, for doing, uh, doing, uh, uh, doing, uh, basically integration quadrature, you know, building up an integral as a cumulative sum. Um, maybe there are better ways of doing that integral, but again, I can leave it to you to find better methods of some of these things. Um, and once we find that integral, we want to find its global minimum. So this argmin gives us the, the, uh, the argument, basically the, the, the index array that I usually use I for uh, uh, of the minimum of that radial integral. The problem with, with, I mean, one could just figure out the value of the Rx, the, the, the radial grid at this, at this value of IR crit, but that wouldn't be the exact value of the, the, the radial location of the critical point. Um, I think we need a, a little better than that. So what I do is create a little array of maybe like 10 or 11 grid zones, you know, five down and five up from that value and use an interpolation routine to figure out where the right-hand side crosses zero. And that generally gives us a location of the critical point that's in between grid zones. So it's a, it's, it's a bit of a more accurate thing. Again, this, this critical point is, is, a, is, a touchy, is a touchy thing to try to integrate up and down from. So, so trying, to get it, uh, trying to get an exact value for it is, is, is useful. Um, so yeah, so once we have that value, we can interpolate other things at the critical point, the, the square of the sound speed, the derivative of that, the derivative of the right-hand side. And then yeah, those derivatives are needed for L'Hopital's rule, right? We need to actually find the slope of the wind speed du over dr at the critical point. And because it's zero over zero, we need to, we need to use L'Hopital's rule to take the derivatives of those. And when you do that, I, I don't think I showed you the algebra of that. When you do that, you get a quadratic equation for the du over dr, and, and you have to use the quadratic formula to solve for that. And the fact that there are two solutions to a quadratic with a plus and a minus, that, that gives us the x type, uh, the, uh, the, two, the, the two slopes at the critical point that, that have this x type uh, behavior. So I'm choosing the plus sign here to get the accelerating solution at the critical point. You can always choose the minus one also and get the other solution. So the rest of this uh, routine here before it returns here at the bottom is mostly just numerical stuff because we, uh, again, the critical point is between array indices 
and we want to find out what are the neighboring array indices because those will be the places where we actually start the numerical integration. So the index crit low, index crit high are the ones right below and right above the, the true value of the critical point. And we had to find those uh, just by finding, you know, the, the maximum value where R is less than the critical value. Um, find some, some numerical uh, 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 finite differences of the radial coordinate. And then when we set up the, the wind speed as a function of radius, we started off with zeros, but then we fill in those two values right above and below the critical point with just, we, we basically inch our way forward from the critical velocity up and down using that L'Hopital's rule slope. And that's sort of the initial little bootstrapping of the solution. And then once we get to these two critical, these two, uh, these two grid zones, then we can just use new standard numerical methods to integrate up from the upper one and down from the lower one, right? So everything here is just, you know, sort of simple solving of a, of a differential equation just by stepping forward and, and solving each, you know, for, for the velocity at each step as a function of the previous one and the finite differences. But we needed to be careful right in the vicinity of the critical point because things can go go haywire right around there. So that's where that L'Hopital's rule was needed. So then we have it and we can call it. We can do a test where we run it. Um, I'm using a number of radio grid zones, typically of 90,000, which is a lot um, because I'm using a very simple integration technique. And again, one of the challenges for you is if, if you wanna do something more sophisticated, you might be able to reduce the number of grid zones. It doesn't take that long to run though integrate up to about 10 astronomical units and put in some, some representative values, say a co coronal maximum temperature of 2 million degrees. Um, yeah, and you can just call it and pull back the, the quantities that you want that it returns. And you can interpolate to figure out the wind speed at 1 AU. And when you do all that, well, for this set of examples, you get 460 kilometers per second, which is a typical number for the solar wind. You can plot what they look like. I also plotted the, uh, the critical point there just to see, make sure there's nothing going haywire around it. So the numerical integrations are well behaved. So that's nice. So the only other thing that this notebook actually does is to reproduce figure one of, of Parker's paper, right? We can get back isothermal temperatures with a delta of zero, which is that slope of the, uh, of the, uh, of the temperature law. So we create an array of, what is it, seven values to, to reproduce Parker's grid of different uh, temperatures. And we call the routine seven times and plot seven times. And it, it, it does it. It does it nicely. So I didn't label them like Parker did with, with the hand-drawn things. But yeah, it goes from a half a million degrees up to four million degrees. And we get it back. It actually works. All right. So yeah, that's really... All I, unfortunately, all I had time to implement, I wanted to implement some of the other bells and whistles, but you can try that. That's what we'll be talking about after this. Um, you can also try to do better with the numerical integration, so you can do it in fewer than 90,000 points. The L'Hopital's rule requires care. One of the other things you can do just to make sure that I'm doing things right is to verify that my uh, that quadratic equation is the right thing to do. You can also play with the negative root and get the Bondi accretion solution because Bondi actually worked that out uh, several years earlier than Parker did uh, for astronomical accretion uh, uh, type uh, environments. Yeah, and that I think was all I had for going through the hands-on exercise. Um, yeah, I can go back to the slides, but I don't know if... Uh, Anybody had any thoughts or questions before we move on? Okay. Again, I'll keep an eye on the chat. Um, yeah. So for the rest of this hour, I guess what I wanted to do was to uh, talk about these extra bells and whistles, right? The extra physical processes that go beyond Parker's ideas, right? Um, so the, first, so the first two of them actually involve the fact that uh, Coulomb collisions, you know, particle-particle collisions uh, 
in the corona and the solar wind are often very infrequent, right? If the collisions were, were very frequent, then you would basically have all the particles sort of combining together into a thermal equilibrium, right? They would all share the same temperature. They would all share the same flow speed. They would all have nice uh, Maxwell-Boltzmann distributions of their, of their velocities, um, but they don't, right? The, the corona is a very low density environment and it gets even lower density as you go out into the solar wind. So you can have these departures from thermal equilibrium. For example, what, what, what is often called multi-fluid effects, right? The properties of the different components, the protons, the electrons, the, the alpha particles, you know, the, the ionized helium atoms and the ionized uh, heavier, uh, heavier elements that are often called minor ions or heavy ions, um, just because numerically they're, they're very negligible in number compared to the, the hydrogen and helium but they all can have different temperatures. And so the, the gas pressure gradient that accelerates the solar wind is a sum over those partial pressures. And we have to figure out what those look like. Um, so I can show you some observations of departures from this kind of thermal equilibrium. So for example, at 1AU, you can sample the proton and electron temperatures and the IC3 spacecraft did that over the course of several years. Um, and if you bin the data and you plot it as a function of the wind speed, I, I forget exactly what phase of the solar cycle this was, but there was a nice broad selection of wind speeds that they discovered, that, 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 they, that they detected. And the electron temperatures in blue, well, didn't seem to change that much as a function of wind speed, but the proton temperatures do. And this has been seen by a lot of other spacecraft at 1AU also. Uh, Heather Elliott at SWERI has done a lot of work in terms of understanding the proton temperature wind speed correlation and the, and the physics behind it. I still don't know if we have a good physical explanation for why, why this positive correlation exists, um, but it's certainly something that, that, that models need to reproduce if they're going to successfully explain the solar wind. Yeah, so that's at 1AU. Um, oh yeah, then of course there's the the helium and the heavier uh, ions. Um, and typically when we see those other ions, we often see them have higher temperatures and higher flow speeds compared to the protons. There's a lot of different data sets shown here. So on the left, we have Justin Casper's uh, analysis of several years, maybe even decades of data from the wind spacecraft. So again, solar wind speed is the x-axis. And the upper plot shows the ratio of the alpha particle temperature to the proton temperature. It's usually greater than one, but there is this uh, positive, you know, rough positive correlation. Slow wind, it's close to one. Uh, for the high speed wind, it's much bigger than one. Um, and one of the things that many theoretical models emphasize is that, well, in plasma physics, there are many processes that want to drive a plasma towards mass proportional temperatures. That is that the ion temperature divided by the proton temperature is the same as the ion mass over the proton mass. That would give you equal thermal speeds for the two species. Um, but we see it exceeding it, right? Most of the data, which is in red here, is up at five and six, right? It's bigger than four, the, the mass ratio from helium to hydrogen. And we see that for other species too, oxygen, and neon, right? The, the red lines here on the right, data from Collier, uh, the, the red lines show a ratio of 16, you know, for oxygen and 20 for, for neon. And the highest speed solar wind exceeds it regularly. Um, yeah, one, the ratio of one is the yellow line here. And eventually, as you get to really slow solar wind, which is really dense solar wind with frequent collisions, then it sort of inches down towards, towards one. The, the bottom plot here also shows the fact that the ions are flowing faster than the protons in the high speed solar wind, but not so much in the low speed solar wind. So this is the, this delta V is the, is the wind speed of the alphas minus the wind speed of the protons, and then expressed in units of the alphane, the, the local alphane speed of the solar wind, which gives a dimensionless ratio here. So yeah, it seems like that the, the higher speed solar wind has, tends to have lower density. That means it has less frequent Coulomb collisions. And that means that 
these departures from thermal equilibrium can happen a lot more easily. Was that it? Oh no, I also wanted to show uh, the radial dependence of some of these things. So for example, if you look at the high speed solar wind, this is again, one of these plots where data from a million different sources is combined together, but I think it's useful. Again, this is height above the solar photosphere in units of the solar radius. So you, you know, we have one AU sort of around here, spacecraft that go in closer to the sun. Part, this is now old, it's a year old or two, almost two years old. But you know, Parker Solar Probe is now sort of in here somewhere, maybe around 15 at its closest perihelion. So there's more data to assemble. Um, and then there's remote sensing, spectroscopy, and other, other ways of detecting temperatures uh, with telescopes and spectrometers. Um, and this is the fast solar wind. So in general, the protons in red are faster than the electrons in blue. Right out here, there's this factor of two to two and a half difference which I think if I go back, whoops, that's that same factor of two to two and a half here at the high speeds between the protons and the electrons. And you see where that sort of gets its start in the corona with the with the spectroscopic data from UVCS. Now, one of the biggest surprises from UVCS, this uh, instrument, whoops, on the SOHO spacecraft was that the temperatures of the oxygen uh, uh, ions in the corona got up to about 10 to the 8 Kelvin. That's 100 million degrees Kelvin. Um, but that's actually sort of right in line with what you'd expect uh, with the measurements out at 1AU. We actually don't have very good ion temperature measurements at other distances. And hopefully, we'll be able to get some, maybe maybe with for alpha particles with Parker Solar Probe. I don't know about oxygen or anything heavier. But yeah, this is sort of what we see when we have departures from thermal equilibrium, the, the superheated ions and the slight difference between the protons and the electrons. All righty. Um, right, so if you want to implement this in the notebook, you want to know how do you actually implement this? Well, if you want to figure out the total pressure, I, I worked out some of the details because I was curious what the expression would look like for the effective uh, the effective squared sound speed that goes into the Parker equations. And it turns out that if you, if you ignore the heavy ions, you could work it out analytically. Um, so if you know the proton temperature, the electron temperature, and the alpha particle temperature, and you also know the relative number density ratio of alpha particles, which for the solar wind can be anything be between, you know, 0.02 to 0.1, right? It's, you know, it, it varies over the solar cycle. Um, but it's a small, this H is a small, is a small number compared to one, but you can work out what this, uh, what the total impact of, of having different temperatures for the different components would be in the, in the Parker equations. So there's that. All right. I think in the outline, I had four effects to talk about. This is the first. The second is another departure from thermal equilibrium, and that's departures from Maxwell distributions in the shapes of the distributions. And these are seen when collisions are infrequent in different ways. Uh, you can have anisotropies. In, in other words, if you have a magnetic field that's defining a direction through the plasma, and you measure the temperature of the gas parallel to the magnetic field, and then you measure it perpendicular to the magnetic field, you can get different answers, different values. And in the lower right um, are sort of contour plots that show these distributions uh, measured by the Helios spacecraft for protons. Um, and yeah, in each of these cases, the diagonal line is the direction of the magnetic field. So in general, you see these sort of elliptical contours aligned along the, the direction of the magnetic field. And if you were to measure the width of the distribution, parallel to the field, you'd get generally get a smaller number than the value you'd get perpendicular to the field. That's for these specific measurements. Sometimes it can go in the other direction. Sometimes it can be prolate rather than oblate, and you'll have a bigger value along the magnetic field. There's also different shapes, right? The, 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 the distance between these contours as you go out, right? If they were just concentric circles, uh, would tell you about the, the, the energy dependence of the, uh, of the distribution. And you can have, whoops, uh, you can have, uh, you know, a, a, in, in log space, a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution would be this, 
this Gaussian or you know inverted uh, inverted parabola in, in in log space. But for electrons, there are these other components that eventually turn into sort of a power law at large enough energies. Um, so yeah, all these things end up influencing the uh, the uh, the acceleration of the solar wind. Um, oh yeah, I wanted to share some other observations of these temperature anisotropies. This is again protons, and the vertical axis here is the ratio of the temperature measured perpendicular to the field to the temperature parallel to the field. So a nice isotropic Maxwellian distribution would be a value of one, sort of cutting through, cutting across the middle of the diagram. This is often called the, the Brazil diagram or the Brazil plot, just from the fact that the shape that, that most of the data seem to fill looks almost like the outline of the country of Brazil. Um, but yeah, this, this tells us a lot. And by the way, the x-axis here is the plasma beta measured in the solar wind. Um, the many of the many of the you know most of the data seem to occupy this middle region of a beta of about one to a few. Um, as you go out further into the solar wind, you go to higher and higher betas. But over many years, months, decades, you know, the spacecraft can measure a large range of these these quantities. So it sort of fills out this diagram. And yeah, some of the patterns in the in the edges of this diagram tell us a lot about plasma instabilities. For example, if you have, uh, if, if the protons attempt to get to large values of this ratio, either you know, above one or below one, uh, the, the, the actual distribution becomes unstable and, and it can really, and it is essentially forced to relax back towards an isotropic distribution. Remember, of course, large beta means the magnetic field is weak and is not doing much to the to the plasma. So you'd expect if there's if the if the magnetic field is not important, then the direction of the magnetic field is not telling the plasma anything important. So you'd expect it to be close to an isotropic distribution. But when the magnetic field gets more important, a larger value of these ratios is is allowed. The 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 left hand of the diagram sort of allows you to figure out what the history of the particles uh, was, right? This is, this is all measured at one AU, but you can, can learn about what the temperatures must have been in the, in the corona from the left hand of the, the diagram. Yeah, I just wanted to give you a summary of different types of measurements. Um, there's a whole lot of physics we could talk about about how these anisotropies actually arise. If you've ever taken a class on, the, on plasma physics or say the Earth's magnetosphere, uh, you would have heard about the conservation of magnetic moment in a collisionless uh, uh, plasma. And in the case of the, of the particles leaving the corona and going out into the solar wind, it's almost like they're going from the poles of the magnetosphere into the equatorial regions, right? From a strong magnetic field to a weak magnetic field. And when that happens for collisionless particles, the... Um, the, 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 the velocity tends to evolve, right? The, the velocity along the field gets higher, the velocity perpendicular to the field gets lower. So if you're going into a weakening magnetic field, you're sort of focused towards this parallel axis, right? So if you have a distribution that started off as a Maxwellian, that distribution gets squished into this cone um, where if you now measure the, the temperature of this squished distribution, the temperature parallel to the field is large, the temperature perpendicular to the field is small. So that's how some of these anisotropies can get formed. So essentially, if I go back, the, the, everything in the bottom half of the Brazil plot essentially represents particles that might have started off as isotropic in the corona, but just evolved out to the weaker magnetic field, and they have a larger parallel temperature than the perpendicular temperature. But we see, we see both, right? We don't just see that. We also see, sometimes see T perpendicular bigger than T parallel. That must mean that there's ongoing sources of heating out in the solar wind and the heat is preferentially acting in that perpendicular direction. That sounds like a weird thing to pull out of, pull out of the air, but that is something that actually happens in plasmas. Uh, there's this thing, there are these things called wave particle resonances one of them specifically is called the cyclotron resonance. It's actually used in you know, tokamaks and laboratory plasmas to heat up the plasma in a, in a certain way. Essentially, if you, 
if you have uh, MHD waves like alphane waves that are uh, circularly polarized, such that the, the electric and magnetic fields of the wave are varying in this sort of helix type uh, uh, polarization, then that can sort of end up uh, acting in resonance with the natural uh, spiral motions that ions have as they, as they flow along the magnetic field. And if they're in resonance, then they can sort of eat up some of the energy from the waves and draw heat, essentially. Uh, and that, that heat is mostly in the perpendicular direction because they're essentially spun up like in a cyclotron around the magnetic field by the existence of these waves. So yeah, so you can get you can get both you can get both types of anisotropies t perp bigger than t parallel t parallel bigger than t perp. So they can both they can both happen. Um, so yeah, so we'd like to know how do we actually use these in the solar wind equations if we want to implement them. Um, well, one of the things that I want to just uh, talk about first because it's related to the fact that the solar as I was saying, the magnetic field is getting weaker as you're going out into the solar wind. You have to deal with this idea of magnetic flux conservation, right? As you're going out, as the, so, as the magnetic field is getting weaker, the cross-sectional area subtended by those magnetic field lines is getting bigger. Now, prior to now, in the Parker spherically symmetric solar wind model, we have, we've essentially been assuming that that area function is, is a radial cone that's going out. So that cross-sectional area increases as R squared. So in, in the actual equations of motion, the place where that shows up is going to be a sort of a logarithmic derivative of A, which for R squared is just going to be 2 over R. Um, and we've seen that 2 over R factor because if we take the original Parker equations that, that we've been talking about, the, uh, the main positive term on the right-hand side has this two over R in it because we've been assuming spherical expansion. So in general, you have to replace the two over R with a one over A times dA dr. Uh, but the other thing to note here is that in the original equations, the squared sound speed shows up in three places. But when we take into account these anisotropic temperature distributions, it turns out that two of them, the first one and the third one, are exclusively having to do with the parallel component of the temperature. And the one in the middle, the main sort of uh, acceleration term uh, for, the, for the pressure gradient, has to do with the perpendicular temperature. So yeah, it's, uh, uh, one, can, one can talk about these differences in, the, uh, in that same magnetosphere theory, right? This whole uh, magnetic moment conservation has this mirroring effect. You can create a magnetic bottle that, that, that forces particles to bounce between them. And the differences between the parallel and perpendicular velocity components or temperature components uh, has a lot to do with the, the forces acting on the particles in such a, such a magnetic bottle. But yeah, I just wanted to, sh to show you essentially how to, how to take the generic Parker equation and, uh, and how it's changed when you have these uh, different types of anisotropies in them. All right, yeah, there's a lot going on here and I wanted to just make sure I, 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 uh, I cover it in some ways, uh, but if anybody has questions, I can point to other papers that derive some of these things from first principles too. Um, the third uh, topic, the third bell and whistle that I wanted to add on to the Parker equations was specifically this idea of non-radial or uh, for the sun's case, super radial expansion of the magnetic field. And this is really what's going on for the sun because as we've talked about the geometry of the sun's magnetic field, you know, we know that at, at any given time, there's a lot of closed loops on the sun. And if you wanna figure out where's the solar wind coming from, it's only coming from a fraction of the surface. But once you get out far enough from the sun, that solar wind basically expands to full, to, 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 to fill the full four pi radians of the volume. And you know, we can see all these various cartoons. And what that means is that on average, the solar wind is expanding out through field lines that are sort of trumpeting out. They're essentially expanding more rapidly than if they were just spherically radially expanding cones. 
So this effect does need to be taken into account. Uh, we've already sort of talked about how to include the generic A of R into those uh, solar wind equations. Uh, the one bit of notation that you've, you've already seen in the readings is that this A of R is often broken up into a radial factor and then a super radial expansion factor, usually called lowercase f, um, that just would be equal to one if everything was radial, but is, is a, usually a growing function of radius for the, for the solar wind. And of course, the, the derivative has to be broken up into the two pieces. Um, yeah, just to show you some examples of what these f of r functions look like in different regions of the corona, right? In polar coronal holes, it's sort of slowly increasing to a large value. In streamers, if you're, if you're going right out above the cusp of a streamer, it's rapidly increasing, then it's decreasing. And uh, as you read in the Wang and Shealy paper, they placed a lot of emphasis on the value of this f at the potential field source surface because that sort of characterizes, that's sort of one sort of scalar thing rather than a full function of R that helps characterize how much expansion the sun's magnetic field is experiencing. Um, yeah, and of course, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, observed anti-correlations between the value of this F at the source surface and the wind speed. Um, yeah, it's something to explore in the, in the notebook too, if you want to. Um, Ah, yes, apologies for having to plot on to, to the final topic, and that's an extra source of acceleration that can occur in the solar wind and that we think is going, that we think is occurring. And that is the so-called uh, phenomenon of wave pressure, sometimes called a ponderomotive force. Um, it's a little, it's a little esoteric, but whoops, essentially what it is is the idea that waves can uh, exert a time averaged force on, on its surrounding medium, right? You know, electromagnetic waves can exert a force. They, they can carry momentum and, you know, photons can carry momentum and they can exert a radiation pressure on matter. Um, well, now we have other types of waves, acoustic and MHD waves. They can do the same thing. They can do a network a net time averaged uh, non-zero work on the time steady gas uh, via sort of similar stress, stress tensor type terms. And yeah, and the, the, the analogy that people often use is the idea of waves breaking on the beach because one of the things that's necessary for this force to exist is for the waves to be propagating through a spatially varying background medium, which the corona certainly is, there's a lot changing as a function of radius. But you know, the, the, the analogous thing is the fact that as waves come in closer to the shore, they're propagating through an ever narrowing, uh, uh, you know, depth of, of water, and that that helps to increase the amplitude of the waves. And the other feature that you sometimes see is if you throw something out into the into the ocean, there is a net preponderance for those waves to, to sort of push it back to shore, that carry, carry the objects back to shore. And I think that's the same general phenomenon as this ponderomotive wave pressure. Um, I don't know if I've ever seen it derived in the same exact way for these types of waves, but everybody often uses this analogy. Um, the way it appears in the equation of motion, the Parker equation, is this extra term on the right-hand side that generally ends up being positive. And it depends on the radial gradient of both the background density in the solar wind and the velocity amplitude of the waves. Um, I wish I would have had more time to derive some more properties of that velocity amplitude. One of the things I can just tell you is that if we ignore the dissipation of the waves, then we can use these equations of conservation of wave energy flux that we talked about a few classes ago. And for alphane waves, the, the general way that they behave with, with radius in the solar wind is to depend on the wind speed and the alphane speed in a certain combination. And those can be sort of, uh, this expression can sort of be massaged a little bit to get the properties as a function, say, of density and, uh, and, and the area expansion factor. Uh, so you can figure out ways of, of incorporating it into the equations. I might, I might, between now and next week, I might do a little bit more work to sort of derive some of these things, but 
please contact me if you want more information on that. The one example I can show is just sort of a parameter study that I ended up doing a few years ago of creating a whole two-dimensional grid of Parker-like models, right? So this, this, this two-dimensional diagram, each point in this grid is a, is a different Parker model. The y-axis is varying the, the peak temperature in the corona. The x-axis is varying the normalization on the alphane waves, uh, say at some fixed, at some fixed height. Um, and it turns out as you turn up, and the contours are the speed, the wind speed at 1 AU. Right? So as you turn up the temperature in the corona, you can get faster solar winds. And if you turn up the waves, you can get faster solar winds. And where does the actual fast solar wind that we, that we measure, where does that fall? I think it falls in this gray box here. Uh, so for example, we know that you know, if you follow these 600 to 800 contours, if you didn't have waves, you would need temperatures up here on the upper left of what is this, two, three, four, five, six, seven million degrees. And if you look back at the average temperatures of the protons and the electrons, which dominate the average temperature, um, you, you don't get, you don't see values this high. You see values of one or two million degrees. Um, so the only way to make, get these high temperatures, these, uh, these high speeds, is to have some component of wave pressure. And this value of about 100 kilometers per second in the corona seems to, seems to agree with what we observe from other sources too. We'll see how Parker Solar Probe measures wave amplitudes as it goes in closer as well. But yeah, I think that was about all I had. Um, please take a look at the notebook. Whoops. Um, you can download it on the, on the Slack. I'll also put it on the web page. And again, like the last time, um, there's really nothing due next week. Uh, the, the, your, your extension uh, of, the, of the notebook is due in two weeks. Um, and yeah, just, just uh, I, I've, I had some suggestions at the bottom there, but please also feel free to explore some of the other physical processes like the different proton and electron temperatures, the different anisotropies, and some of these other things. Um, and yeah, contact me if you'd like some more guidance on applying things like the, uh, the super radial expansion factors and the wave pressure. I didn't have time to boil them down into a, into a you know, code ready uh, set of equations for you, but, but, but yeah, I'd, I'd like to think a little bit more about that too. And yeah, let me know if you're, you're curious to, to work on those. Yeah. I, I don't know if I have anything more. Any, any questions about all that stuff? It was a lot, unfortunately. Steve, have those waves, uh, the ponder motive waves, ever been observed in the solar wind in any way? Um, the, the wave, I mean, the, the overall fluctuation amplitude of alphane, alphanic fluctuations has been observed. Um, a few classes ago, I showed one of these one of these plots where the, the data was assembled from a lot of different sources. And the amplitude in the corona does seem to be uh, close to what's, what's required uh, from what I just showed. Um, the actual, if you're asking, has the actual process of wave, you know, ponderomotive wave acceleration been observed? I don't think so. Um, I don't even know how that would be done. Um, Back in the 1960s, um, Chuck Goodrich, who became well known at NASA for in, in the heliophysics division, uh, did his PhD thesis on what would the velocity distributions that look like in a collisionless plasma if all you do is push on the gas with this ponderomotive wave acceleration. And he, he derived some odd shapes for those distributions, but I, I've always been curious to see if if that work could be revived and we could actually search for those signatures, the sort of microscopic signatures of the wave acceleration in the distribution functions in themselves. But beyond that, I don't know if we can, if there's a smoking gun for that effect. But yeah, if there's if there's nothing else, we can we can end a few minutes early today. Um, yeah, there was some other good discussion in the Slack. Um, 
in some of the other, I think in the random channel too, there were some interesting, interesting things, but feel free to check those out. But yeah, always feel free to contact me if there's anything else. I can stop the recording. Yeah, I, I was interested to uh, do that calculation myself of what kind of, um, you know, proton energies you get in the solar wind. That's right. Yeah, yeah. At the various uh, speeds we've we've seen, and and it's of course non-relativistic and very low energy, so there's no radiation danger at all from any of the 